Hi there. Um, that was uh, me frantically uh, setting things up because I lost track of time. <laughs> so welcome. I figured I'd do he another. You rated my stream with 15 viewers. Right on time. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Jesse. I was just uh, mentioning that I lost track of time a little bit watching Thank all that cool the art stuff you were doing. It's like, oh, geez, it's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> Forgot I did that. Um, so, but luckily, luckily, all of that automation stuff that I do with OBS pays off immensely in these situations. I just have a few buttons to press and then we are all set. So, bring in the chat here. Hello, everybody. Um, yep, hello, Jesse. Uh, Dated the Labs. Um, Allison, yep. Uh, Ron and Tan, thank you. Thank you so much. So, what are we doing tonight? I admit, I had had one thing in my head and I kind of thought a little better of it. Um, we're not gonna do shiny tests tonight. Um, I think we, we covered a lot of that pretty well last night. I think now I'm toying between some minor refinements, the shiny cow, based on some great uh, ideas from the community to make it a little more, a little more polished UX. Or maybe we try something just brand new. I don't know yet. Maybe, um, who knows? Well, let's see. Um, so now the part that I think I may have a little bit of a hang up in, I have to get my uh, trusty development environment set up again, but I think it should be fine. Um, I think for ease of easing into this, I'm gonna look at our shiny cow project again and knock out some quick wins for enhancements and kind of show you the power of one of my favorite packages that's going to make some of the time zone stuff a little easier and maybe we'll even style it up a little bit because the feedback's been, been really nice on that front um, so you're about to see my massive set of tabs on my browser because i did not have time to clean it up yet but of course it's going crazy on my other monitor uh gotta love fumbling with with setup here e firefox don't do this to me now okay we're almost there we are almost there um move that here okay source and chat there we are okay we got a mess of tabs here most of it from last night so let's get to our github repo for shiny cow what is that about fire oh lovely okay gotta restart firefox i guess <laughs> did a system update before the stream and uh gotta let it open please don't let anything crash all right all right i think we're good now let's go to github I will put the link in the chat if any of you want to follow along with me on this. This is the shiny cow repo right here. And I have a few things I've already kind of outlined in the issue tracker. Um, first of which as I want to make it easy for anybody that not just share their ideas, but to actually contribute with code or if they find a bug, if they want to be able to fix it. So I do want to add like a contributing guide on the GitHub repo just to outline some of these. And you'll see these a lot with the um, really great packages from our studio, of course, and many others in the community so that no matter what your experience level is, it's easy to kind of get up and running with either issues that have been labeled kind of like good first time issues or getting your development environment set up. So we'll. We'll probably flesh that out at some point. But what I wanna call attention to is, um, I don't know if they are here tonight, but Unicorn Coder has been um, a great kind of uh, participant in this process, along with some of the other streams that me, me and, and others have done. So they have had some really nice feedback here. Let's kind of look at this together and see what, um, what we'd like to tackle. So what? unicorn code or like so far the color picker um and in fact maybe before we go into this let's look at shiny cow again just to 
for those that haven't seen it yet, um, if I can type my shiny apps stuff. Okay, let's bring it up here. Any minute now. Yep, waiting, waiting, waiting. Come on, come on. There you go. All right. So, it still doesn't look as stylish as I would like yet. But, yeah, thanks, Tan. That is the, the link to it. But what happened since the last time I did development on it, at least on stream, was that we do have a way to actually choose your preferred time zone and it will automatically update. So if I choose the time zone that I'm in, which is Eastern New York time, change the font color a little bit. Now you can see everything that's happening here. And yeah, so I'm, what you see in the entries is kind of like the titles on Twitch that are happening. Um, so I obviously still called this one a generic one because I wasn't sure what I'd talk about on Thursdays. If I keep this up, I don't know if Thursdays will always be this, but I figured I'd give it a shot. Um, but yeah, here we are. Um, and like we saw before, if I click on any of these, you'll see the VOD on the right. Um, their, their latest VOD, so there's Jesse's right there. But there's some feedback about this too. So before I get to that, let me address some stuff in the chat. Tan is asking if I ever consider having your own Shiny App server. Um, yes, I have done that before. It's honestly just a matter of the time to maintain it, but I know exactly how to do it. I've done it on using Shiny Server Open Source deployed on DigitalOcean or Linode. Those are two uh, popular v VPS uh, providers for the cloud. But I've also done some stuff with Shiny Proxy before, so I might dive into that one a little bit, but it's just like the, the time I have, I don't want to maintain another cloud deployment right now if for right now Shiny Apps IO is doing the job for Shiny Cal. But I definitely have done it um, both for personal stuff and we spun up some really interesting stuff on AWS with, with Shiny. So I've been there. Yep. <laughs> we just, yeah, I um that's a good point. I should use the Indiana time. Why not? I yeah. For those that don't know, I am in the Midwest in Indiana, so technically this would be the closest one to me. Yep. <laughs> Now, let's, we'll get to the feedback. Let me get through the issue first, and then I'll get to the time zone stuff. There's some interesting stuff around that. So, um, uh, Unicorn Coder is thinking that the font size under the headers should be a little bit different. And this is something I thought about too, is right now, I've stitched a bunch of elements together with not a lot of, um, design enhancements like padding and margins. So everything's kind of like going to the full boundaries of the screen, which for some cases is just fine. But this thing I've kind of maximized a lot of the real estate. Um, we probably want to put like maybe a, a framing around that, even if it's white space for now, but just to make that a little better. Um, so this was before I added the time zone feature, um, but they were, it used to be just defaulting to um, two of them. It used to be defaulting to Eastern time and also UTC, but now we have a lot more. So um, but the other thing that maybe we'll get to tonight if I have the energy is that the video box, once you pop it up, just kind of stays there until you click on the next uh, different streamers entry. But we should have a way to like wipe it out somehow. So that's going to take some uh, web magic that I may or may not know how to do. Um, so I'll. So the getting back to the time zone stuff, um, and actually, Unicorn Coder has contributed some code into this issue. Um, first, a dark mode, which would be pretty cool to do, and also. They've done some great uh, cleanup of the time zones in HTML. You can take a look at that here in this link. 
Um, they've done both the dark mode thing and the time zone thing. I'm thinking I might do the time zone thing first. But you can see here, now we're looking at raw HTML here. So, I, some of you have been hearing Jesse talk about Shiny. Well, of course, Shiny is wrapping HTML code. So behind the scenes, when you have things like select input or things like that, these are the kind of things you'll often see as a select with options inside. But what's cool about this is that there, what Unicorn Coder has done here is group them into different groups. If I can say group enough. So we have the US group, Canada group, and a whole bunch of others. And they obviously took a lot of time to to do this and I want to um, so I want to bring this in to shiny cow to make it a little easier now I'm I can do this a couple different ways I could do this as a custom function that spits out raw HTML and hence mimics what a select input does but I think what we can do is we can take the contents of this and fold it into a certain input that I am using already for that um, time zone picker and that would be shiny widgets shiny widgets is easily one of my favorite shiny community packages because these widgets strike the great balance of clean style and functionality to do really cool stuff um, yes, Tan is right with me on this one. We may not agree about Golem, but we do agree about Shiny Widgets. Shiny Widgets for life. That's a that's an Easter egg for those of you that like a sport that I like. Um, so the input I'm thinking of that I actually use already in Shiny Cow is called Picker Input. Let me jump back to the app for a second. So what I mean by that is you saw all the time zones here that are listed. Wait, where's my finger pointing at? Ah, there. Yeah, always get it mixed up. Um, but if I wanted to search for like London, there's a nice little search box and I can quickly select London and now I've got it for uh, my... I have a lot of good friends in, in, in England that like to do our stuff and Linux stuff so they could look at their times for their zone here too. So picker input gives me that search box functionality. I think that is awesome. Um, sorting, I don't think, is the problem. Um, Unicorn Coder says that they saw some inconsistencies with the time zones that we have here. So I'll get to where I got the, from got these in a second. But all we need to do for picker input is going back to the shiny widgets thing. Is they have an example here where you can do grouped options, which is basically exactly what we want to do here. And the code for it is fairly straightforward. Um, thank you for the follow, Ergophobic Goblin. Oh, thank you for the follow, Ergophobic Goblin. <laughs> I knew I was going to have a tough time with that, but the text to speech took care of it. Um, thank you for the follow. Much appreciated. Um, so I want to leverage the idea of doing groups here, um, although I'm not quite. Oh, am I on the right one? Oh, I was in the wrong one. Okay, this is one here. So we have list. They do a list of the choices where they, the first group is called lower. It's a named list element of vector of character elements. And then upper is another one too. Yes, yes, Tan's right. He knows where I'm going with this. Another awesome feature of picker input is the idea of subtext. And this is exactly what I wanted to do here. Because in subtext, you can see here, actually, no, you can't because the chat's covering it. Let me, sorry, I'll, I'll wipe out chat for a second here. Of course, I messed up my viewing here. Okay, what you see here is, it may not be as visible. Let me zoom in a little bit one more time. Come on, Firefox, be nice. Um, you can see there is a little, and these, this is from the cars data set or empty cars or whatever. Um, next to the car names, it's got the little subtext of the MPG value. This 
where, where Tan and I are thinking here alike is that not just showing the character label, the time zone, but showing the offset, which is often you see like a plus some amount of hours, something like that. That would be really good. That way you get kind of the best of both worlds. You would still search based on the character, but you would get that extra help of that added kind of like descriptive text next to the choice. So that's done via the subtext feature. And that's where you can, we're gonna have to be a little careful with this, but the idea is that you can make a character string to go with each choice. In this case, they did the row names of empty cars, but then the choice ops was just simply a list of pasting MPG with the actual MPG values. So the tough part for me will be, how do I get all those offsets easily without typing them manually? Because that would be probably the most boring stream ever if you see me typing offsets of different time zones for over, I think it was like 60 entries in that dropdown. So we're definitely not going to do that uh, if, we, if we can't find an automatic way to pull that off. Um, so that's a good question, uh, uh, Weebo said, Buddha, out of curiosity, does anyone other than tech folks use GMT? As a, yeah, uh, is a common outside the US. Um, it's actually a great question, but I do, some of the podcasts I listen to, especially in the general tech, if they have hosts that are not from the US, there's even one I listen to where the host is from uh, Canada, which is still in North America, but he'll often prefix the time from the Canadian time and then quickly say like 1100 UTC or something like that. It's like automatic for him. He's like a genius and can convert it all in his head. But I definitely don't hear that as much for our colleagues here in the U.S. But I could be wrong, but that's just my impression. Um, UTC is the one I often hear brought up by my um, friends across the pond, so to speak. Um, especially those that I race with, we often speak in UTC as well as our, in their case, their London time or their Switzerland time or things like that. Um, which, by the way, it's side tangent, but it's probably going to be within the month that season three of the best virtual racing league that I've been a part of will be starting again, and I got to defend that trophy. I've had some good practice runs, um, although I haven't been perfect. I'm definitely rusty, so there is going to be a chance that the champ is dethroned, but I've, I've been training. I always like to train. <laughs> All right, so we'll get back to the shiny cow here. So let's go ahead and try to modify the um, the time zone picker. And I'll show you what I did previously. And we'll try to adapt Unicorn Coder's example snippet into something that works for, um, for shiny cow here. OK. So now comes the part where things might get messed up here. Um, let's see if my environment works. And of course, okay, you're seeing a blank screen here. Here comes a mini rant about OBS with window captures. It seems to have the memory of a fish because even though for this window capture that I have for VS Code, I have VS Code literally right in front of me, it thinks it can't find it. So you're going to see a little um, black for a second while I tweak this on the fly. Hold on. And we're back. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Okay, why that just happened? Why am I not like Tan and all the others that just shared their own screen? Well, I'm one of those uh, gluttons for punishment because I have a 4K monitor and I have heard very scary things about trying to share a 4K screen 
and having OBS downscale that to 1080p on the fly, where it will probably make your CPU or graphics card um, turn out a lot. So actually this window capture here is on a VS Code window that takes up about a quarter, the upper left of my screen. So I actually, when I look at it, it looks kind of small, but for all of you watching this, it's gonna look pretty much full screen. So let me resize it a little bit. Okay, we're, we're good there. Oh yeah, you, so Tan, you do share like the top left portion. Yeah, okay, that, that's cool. Um, I have thought about that. Um, I might try that sometime. Um, the good news about my setup is that right now I'm using like my totally tricked out immense amount of hours version of OBS setup here, but I have a parallel one that I set up for demo purposes, like that first uh, screencast I did about getting started with OBS a couple months ago or whenever that was. I can just do crazy stuff on that and not break my my uh, my production setup if I want to sound really fancy here. Okay, so let's get ourselves oriented again. We're gonna get to the um, time zone picker and I'll show you what I did for that. So first, the trick that I've been alluding to in other streams that I've done before here is that with VS Code, and split the file and have it open twice, have one part be the UI part and then scroll down for the server part for that same thing. So what we want is the time zone. Okay. So in fact, this one's actually straightforward. So now you're about to see what I did for this. Let's first get R set up here and you'll see what I'm talking about. In base R, I somehow stumbled upon this on some Google searches when I started doing the time zone research. There is a base function called Olson names. Now when I run this, this is gonna have a lot of stuff, so be, be wary. Look at all that. So somehow it has an internal data file of all like the, the textual labels of all these time zones. Um, so that is literally how I got the choices of it. I just used base R to do it. So that's fine. But there may be, there may be some inconsistencies here that Unicorn Coder has spotted. So while this got me the initial feature, I always thought I would refine it in some way. And some of the things we just talked about a few minutes ago are what we're going to try and do tonight. Okay, so I actually don't need the server side for this right now, but we will need it probably in a little bit. And the question will be, how do I capture these data? So... We're gonna go the prototyping mode here, so to speak. And what I'd like to do for my um, Shiny apps here is that whether this is a golemized app or not, I like to have a subdirectory and I give it the very boring name of prototyping. And by default, the contents of this directory are not version controlled other than the readme. That way I can just experiment with some toy stuff and if I find something that works, then I port that code over to the main app and of course version control that stuff. But that way I don't, it kind of keeps things a little cleaner. So I've got, I did some YAML stuff with this before, but we're gonna start doing some cleanup of the code that Unicorn Coder gave me for those HTML choices and try to get it into a format that the Shiny Widgets Picker input will support. So. Let's, let's get that going. So we're gonna do a new file and I'm gonna start copying over that code from basically the gist that a Unicorn Coder had set up. Oh, they did, a, they did their own repo for it. So on the other screen, I'm gonna start copying stuff. Um, all right. And we're gonna see what uh, some, some like string magic 
for VS Code will look like to replace certain things dynamically. I can't guarantee it'll work, but we may, we'll get there eventually. So I'm grabbing a whole bunch of time zones and I think I got it. Okay. All right, here we go. So what we have here are all of the options. Let's save this now before we forget. Um, we're going to put this in the prototyping. I'm going to call it raw here. Okay. So had I done an app that was using an HTML template kind of setup like you can with Shiny, I actually wouldn't have to do much more. I could just fold this in if I wanted to, but I do want to just get this, get this in there and see what we can do to um, get this into the R kind of native format. So we're going to do some replacing of stuff. Now, what we want to do first is we want to detect how many opt groups we have. So I'm just going to do a quick search first and see what we have here. So like we have 28 opt groups. And so what this is going to look like in terms of the choices for the picker input is we're going to do a list. The names of the list are going to be what these opt group labels are. So I'm kind of hoping there's a way to do this semi-dynamically, but I'm not quite sure how, although I may have just thought about something. This is an HTML file, right? Can we use something like Arvest to scrape this HTML file? I feel like I'm going really inception level here, but it's my it's my stream. Why, oh, jeez, I just destroyed it. Okay, um, why not? Let's uh let's give this a shot. Let me uh, clear this output here. Do I have Arvest in here? Let's find out. No, we don't. Okay, so let's throw it in. Okay, easy enough. And let's start an R script in here um, to parse out this HTML file. I always like to save it right away first. Um, okay, so let's get. We're gonna need the plier in here. We're gonna need our vest in here. Get these loaded. Okay. Then we're gonna. What did I call that file? Called oh, it uh. Time zones raw. I have absolutely no idea if this is gonna work, but I feel like if I can just extract all those option groups, and then without having to manually find them one by one. It's worth it. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Um, so let's see. I'm going to be very boring and do a variable called X. Ah, GitHub Copilot. Thanks. We want to do that. We should probably do. Let's see what happens. Let me run this. Okay. Okay. Let's see what X looks like here. Yep. They got the document here. So, the way our vest works, this is actually going to have a callback to some of the things I did in that um, stream last week where we started scraping some professional wrestling data. That's a fun watch if you haven't seen that one yet. What we want to do here is I want to um, select just the nodes of opt group. So now I got... I did that last week, but it didn't, parts of our vest still don't retain in my head. So I've got to 
remember this. So I want to say it was um, HTML ATTRs, I think. And let's see if we can get opt group. I don't know. Let's let's see what happens here. Oh, well. Let's see. I need to. Did I do that right? Let's see here. I'm just gonna look at the example here. Or maybe I want HTML elements. Maybe, maybe I want that instead. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, what does X look like here? Oh, look at that. Hey, hey. Nice. I literally stumbled into this stuff. I am not an expert at scraping because it's been so long and I just went by muscle memory on that. Okay. So now what we want now is just get the HTML text from that. I think that will do it. Let's see what X is. No, that wouldn't do it. What am I doing? Okay. Um, did I do that right? HTML. Uh, I feel like that should have worked though, but let's do the nice thing first. We look at the help page for, um, for our vest, and let's see what I messed up here. Our vest is right down here. Get element text. Maybe I need the HTML text too. Maybe let's try that. I don't know. Maybe I did something silly here. here no that's still nothing okay what's going on here wait a minute wait a minute no i let's run this first i think you'll see what i mean um we want the label so that i think we need to do an html atrs all right, let's see if that does it. No. Why is, I feel like that should have done it. Let me try that again. Okay, maybe it just, okay, HTTRS doesn't work, but ATTR works. Okay, so that, is that a, is that a character vector already? Oh, sure is. Okay, we got our groups. So we got our groups here. This is going to be the names of our list now. Because it's going to pre it's preserving the order that it came from that excerpt that we just copied from GitHub. Now we grab instead of just um, the, the groups. Let's move this over here so we can look at it together. We want the options. So I think this is going to work in a similar fashion, but we want to do this so that we preserve that these set of options are belonging to the USA. This set uh, belongs to Canada, et cetera, et cetera. So that might be a job for, wait for it, the per package. Per is quickly becoming one of my top five favorite packages. I absolutely love it. I cannot go back to L apply stuff in base R after going to per. It just makes my life so much easier. And it's much more easier to know why things are happening. Like when it fails, you kind of know why it fails versus something's of L apply. Things are very cryptic or it might not look like it fails, but then when you inspect the result, it does look odd. To say the very least. So let's try some per magic here. But the elements we're gonna I should give this a better name now. We're Alright, let's do 
and some roots. I'm gonna do comments here. That was a good tip from last time. Always add your comments to have your train of thought here. Um, import root labels. So we got that, and then now we're going to extract individual time zones for each group. Okay. Okay, so. I'm just gonna give a very generic name here. So we're gonna do her. We're gonna do a simple list first. Oh, no worries about tan. Um, um, so, okay, you're asking, is the idea that this is a smaller subset of regions? It might it might be. I just haven't exhaustively looked at it yet. But um, I'm going to give Unicorn Coder the benefit of the doubt that they did some analysis on what I had in the choices before and that there were some entries that they said were redundant or simply not valid and that wherever this came from is like a more um, truthful source. So that's where I'm, I'm going by that for now. Um, so we're gonna go here. And whenever I start these things um, in per, I do an anonymous function first. And if I get it working, sometimes I'll make that into a, a more dedicated function and I clean up the per call. So the way you do that, um, I'll make this a little wider here, is in per you do the tilde notation with a, of a curly bracket. And then this is where you start can do like function code, but just using the argument that came in this case, the character value for time zone group. So that's what we're gonna work on now. So, um, I think the thing we'll do is we're just going to have another object that's just the raw HTML um, import. Um, I'm going to call this SRC and just keep it like this so that we don't have to do this um, every time. So we got that. Um, that's nothing fancy, but that will make things easier. Um, now, here comes the, the trick here. We need to... Um, let's see, I'm gonna... Yeah, I always struggle with the name things, but let's just do um, all res for now. Um, so we're going to take the time zone SRC we are going to HTML. Now, if I just do op group, it's going to only get these. It's not going to get the options. I still want the options, but I got to somehow know which options belong to which group. So this is interesting here. Um, I'm having a bit of a brain lapse here, but let me just uh, prototype this here for a little bit. Um, run. Yeah, we're going to do. I don't know, I'm just curious what this will give me. Um, yeah, so what you see here is it doesn't, it doesn't know which group it came from. It just knows they're in um, a verbose thing. So you can see in HTML, um, if you look on the right side here, that op group is literally just close the tag right away so even in the html it doesn't really say that these options belong to this group for like succinctly it just happens to group them here and then it goes to the next one 
So, what we may end up having to do is splitting this file by the line breaks so that we have separate files for each option group. I feel like I'm engineering this way too much here, but I, this is actually a kind of interesting problem for me to solve here, so I'm okay with living a little dangerously here. Because um, to Unicorn Coder's credit, they did a line break for each um, group here, sometimes more than one. So maybe what I do now is I'm just going to make sure there's only one line break between each group. Since I'm in control of this file, I can do that now. Just do that right here. Okay. Got that. Got that. Any other ones? Yep, that one. That one's good, that one's good, that one's good. Okay, we're good. Let's save that out. Um, let's see. Now what we want to do is do some per magic, but now we're going to create new files based on this. And technically, I don't really care what the files are called. Just as long as it's something different, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I actually, I can still use the time zone groups as this, so actually that's gonna play in my favor here. Um, so we're gonna create new files for each time zone group. So this is becoming the per show right now. Um, I'm gonna per walk this thing and let me make sure I can. Oops. I wanna make sure I have the chat close to me because I do something really silly here. Hey Owen Hugh, welcome back. Uh, nice to see you again. I had I had almost forgotten about this the, the doing this um, until I uh, Jesse reminded me that I was losing track of time. It's like, hey Eric, you're streaming tonight? Yes, I am. Whoops. Um, so we're doing some more uh, more shiny stuff, but I am in VS Code again. Um, although I'm not doing anything that radical right now, I'm just doing some basic R um, web scraping. So, um, so what we want to do now is I want to make new HTML files for each of these um, op groups here, so we can still take advantage of the fact that we have these here. And now we're going to. Um, Okay, so actually, what it, this isn't going to really help here, is it? Um, I can split this. I can do read lines on this file, and then split it by a new character. Maybe I don't need per for this after all. So scratch that. Um, okay, it's been a while since I did read lines verbatim. Well, let's give it a shot. Um, I have no idea how to call this. Um, ah, it's a terrible name, but um, three lines source HTML. Just kind of curious if this works on its own. So, whoops. Let me expand that. Incomplete final line. All oh, that always annoys me. Um, in case you ever see that when you import a, a text file, just add a new line at the end, then you won't get that that warning at the end. What I thought I oh hold on here. All right, that should be fine. Let's try that again. Okay, now it's good. Okay, so. I'm just curious what the source read look like when I print it out. Oh yeah, that's 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 icky. That's icky. Okay, we gotta do this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I probably should suppress the warnings. I'm just too lazy to do it. Um, but that's a that's a good catch. Um, okay, so now 
Is there an easy way to create new files based on the splits of these lines? Let's uh, find out. Actually, let's let's go to like near the top here. Sorry, I'm making you busy all here. So what we have here is that this is a character vector now with each line being an element with a lot of white space, but the key is finding which of these elements are the um, kind of like the, the line breaks. But I'm, I feel like there's got to be a better way to do this, so that's what we're doing. We're going, we're going on uh, some searching. We're going on some searching now. So let's, um, um, split a new line. I'm not sure if that's a great search term. Or maybe I want to do, um, split file, a new line, I don't know. Okay, that is, uh, that's Python. Split a string and lots of Python stuff here. Um, well, a lot of people do like Python for, um, split the text processing, so more power to it. Um, I'm probably making this too hard on my, oh, well, Tan. This is why if you're doing streaming, you hope Tan comes because he always comes to the rescue on these. Let's give this a shot. Um, STRI split line. So what STRI is from the string I package. Oh, you're reading my Google results. Oh, is that what this is here? Oh, it's right there. Oh, shit, silly me, okay. Um, each character string in a given vector into text lines. Kind of hoping they have an example here, but I'm wondering. See, I already have the character vectors of each line. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is a way to detect which of these are the um, option group. Maybe this is the same thing. We can try it, I guess. Um, from string i s t i split lines a list of character vectors so it's expecting a character vector which we have What's omit empty do? Oh, sorry, I'm going back to VS Code for a second. Um, okay, let's see what omit empty does. Ah, come on, come on. Oh, that doesn't give me any real help here. Ah, ah. Where was I? Let's just see what happens here. Okay, so that... <laughs> that didn't quite do what I wanted. It made an individual list of each, of each item. But there's probably a way to tweak that a little bit. Um, wonder if omit empty helps here. That's what that other argument was. Let's see what happens when we do that. Not really. Okay, okay. So that may may not uh, help here. Um, it's got to be an easier way. Um, just curious if there's anything else here if I can. Uh, like I wanted that file. Hmm. Oh, I'm really making this hard on myself. All I want to do is just save that. This is one of those things where should I just do this manually and bite the bullet, or should I still pursue this like automated route? I don't know. I feel like there's a. I I feel like I'm I'm. 
Oh, oh, yes, that is an option. We could do a paste of all these vectors, but collapse it. Yeah, okay, let's, let's see. So string I, that's going to be up. We'll just keep it in here. So let's just experiment with this. Um, let's read. Oops. Let's see what happens when we do this. Okay, so it definitely got everything in one place. Um, so it's basically turned it back into into what it would be if I just imported this into R directly. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting solution that Tan has come up with. We make a tibble with the label being the HTTR attribute for label, the value being the value. Okay, well, I'm, I'm curious to see what this looks like. Um, Make a pivot. Alright, I'm gonna pipe that. And then value. It's gonna be the same kind of thing. This is very similar to what we did in the scraping the stream uh, last week. Just a little. A little different. ATTR. Alright, what kind of tibble do we have here? And a whole lot of nothing. Um, did I screw that up? Let's see. Oh, it's giving me a missing there. Okay. Um, I see where you're going with that, though. But maybe I just need to do the... Um, Opt group. Yeah, maybe I need to do it this way. Oh, HTML children. Oh, okay, okay. Let's see if that helps. All right. Does that give us what we want? Not white or do I have to put some in HTML children? No, I don't. Okay. HTML elements. Oh, okay. So what I was thinking, Tan, is that I think we still need this, right? I think we still need this, right? The, the select the op groups element and then we can do this fun stuff, I think. Let's see. Well, not a whole lot of nothing there. I'm just curious, let's just see what what this would do. I haven't used the HTML children stuff. Oh, it gives me nothing there. Yeah, I thought about grep. Um, I feel like since it's HTML, we should do something that's like more of an HTML scraping thing. Um, so I think what I'm just experimenting with here is that, yeah, Isomore, what we're doing now, this is kind of a, a very esoteric thing, but I got some great feedback for Shiny Cow on updating the time zone choices. And my, uh, my contributor, Unicorn Coder, gave me raw HTML of the choices. And I want to get it imported into R so I can feed it into Shiny Widgets and do a cool little trick with that picker input to show the groups and the individual values of each of them with hopefully some UTC offsets at the as the kind of more descriptive text. So all we're trying to do now is just get this file into R, but then make a list where each list element is one of these groups of time zones. 
But see, one thing about this uh, opt group is its own element. It technically doesn't have children, I think, because these options are literally just like placed afterwards. So I feel like there's not a lot of... So what I was trying to do now is I want I first wanted to try and split this file into one file per opt group so that then I could just import these files one by one and be intelligent about what what they are um, so anyway that's that's what we're trying to do but we're trying to get a clever way of getting the opt options here imported so it's matched the um, option group so we're very we're very much in the weeds right now but I feel like we're, we're kind of close because this is what we got when we do the read HTML and getting the label we got the label so like and then when we just do the time zone source HVC options then you get all the options but it's not aware of the groups that it came from so that's why we're going through this um, yeah we do but we're not quite there yet I want to um, yeah I definitely want your thoughts on this Tam please do if, if I if I if you have an easier way um, my last results to do, do all this manually of course um, oh of course you got a gist okay let's look at that together folks all right let me pull it up on the, the massive set of tabs here and let's look at it together all right so you've got the option group or that the raw HTML and then here form select form select did I miss something here oh okay okay I didn't copy all that in okay I got it I got it um so we should um yeah i i missed the start and end tags but the idea is to drill down to the select children okay okay so i think maybe i should have kept that in there yeah you're you're right tan you're exactly right so with that we're gonna go back to this and i'm gonna throw them back in the file um well, it, it, yeah, but it's one of those things where I just want to make sure I'm absolutely consistent with everything. I'm very uh, paranoid about these things. Um, so then I will get... Let me go back to the other part here. That was... Form action, okay. So this should take care of it. We'll just put this into the main file up here and then we'll go with the gist here. All right, I think I got it. So we're gonna go back to, um... yeah, okay, let me um, get your, your gist back over here. Copy the code you had here. Okay. And we'll start cleaning this up. I'll get back to VS Code we go. Let's read this again. And then let's change the X Y variable. Y works. And that did. At least I think. And let's see what happens. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. You know what we need? I need. Um, <laughs> 
I need like some magical thing on OBS that every time Tan solves a problem, we like do some kind of magical celebration gift or something because literally you would probably save me about if I added up all the amount of time in these streams, that I've been debugging something esoteric and you just come swooping in with the rescue. You probably save me over two hours of the buggy time. I'm, I'm not joking at all. Um, so that's awesome. That is awesome. And you're gonna see why this is so cool. So let's save this as a tibble or a variable. And when I view this, now what's nice is that now we can take advantage of our skill set of tidy burst, deep ply, or all that good stuff to know that if the label is not blank, that's the name of the group, and if the value is blank, that means it is the group, but if the label is blank here, it's the actual value. Yeah, yeah, get up, go pilot. You ain't got nothing on tan. Yeah, you ain't got nothing. Um, so put that in a quote somewhere <laughs> so what we got to do is we're basically all the way there we just now have to um, get this into picker input and we can actually now we can use per to get that list object that picker input needs because I don't think picker inputs going to be okay with just a data frame on this um, yeah, Tan, you may have a new career on your hands if you're not careful. We got, we got everybody wanting you to replace GitHub Copilot now. Um, so what we can do with this is we can, um, we're going to revise how we do it, but it's going to be the same idea as we're going to take advantage of um, some tidyverse code here. IDR fill, oh, come on, really? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> how do I not know about these things? So is that simply how it works? Let's see. No, I must have screwed some up there. Um, what is IDR fill? Oh, label. Oh, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it needs to know what to fill, of course. Yikes, yikes, yikes. What did I just do? I just nuked something. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, that should do it. Yep, okay, so we got the labels here. So, perfect, perfect. So, we can drop the NAs now, and basically, we've got our grouping set up. So, filter. That is that NA value. And this should do it. Yep. I can do filters pretty well. If I know something that I can do right, it's filters. <laughs> um, so let's view, view it. Oops. Yep, this is exactly what we want here. We've got the, the label, which is our group, and the value. So basically, I think I just need to turn this into a list and then I'm all set. We're each list has a sub list of character vector wait with the name of the label because i don't think picker input will let me do um the data frame for the choices but it doesn't hurt the look that's why i'm yeah named vectors okay that's what i'm gonna List the values to select from. If elements of the list are named, then the name rather than the value is selected by the user. And we want to do the choice opt. Oh, wait, yeah, I need to refresh my memory here. Um, where's the group example? Let me um, let me find that on the HTML page. Where did we go? Yeah, so I'll, I'll put it into the, the VS Code file and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So what we want is when we actually do this, we want the choices to be a list where each named element 
or named component is a vector of stuff, but that name is going to be what that group is. So that's why I want to get this data frame now into a list of name stuff. So I think like I've, I've converted list to data frames before and I think all we need to do is just do a per on this. E frame? Oh, what is, oh that. Yeah, I'm learning new stuff. See how out of touch I am with the, the new Tidyverse stuff? Yeah, we're, <laughs> I love this. Um, so group by, that definitely makes sense. We want to group by label. Um, Cause we're gonna do stuff to each group. Um, and then I'm okay, going to summarize. It's been a while since I did that. Value equal. Yeah, let's make a this list out of it. Yeah. And then the frame. Okay. Just curious what it looks like when I run it like this first. Oh, what? Oh, it's from Tidy R, I imagine, right? I think. Oh, Tibble. It's from Tibble. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, E N frame. I remember that one. I don't remember D frame. Okay. Yeah, so that's like the converse of it. That is magic. Bam! I love it. Oh, that is. I'm taking that. I am taking this to some projects at work. That is just slick. Like, I've been getting some flack from some of my teammates on my um, affinity for the Tidyverse pipeline stuff. A lot of them are, and no, no offense to anybody, but they're still kind of um, in the base R mindset, which is great for some of the stuff they do. But the fact that I could get from the HTML to a data frame, then to a list, this is like, this is rad. I love it. I love it. And this is actually exactly what we need. So now how do we deal with this for the app is we're going to put this raw HTML file into the set of files that the app can access kind of from the start. And then in the server, in the server code for now, I'll put this processing in and then in the time zone picker, we're going to render it this way instead. So I think our prototyping is done. We better save this. And you know what? The comments are going to tell the full story. All credit goes to Tan for rescuing me yet again. All right. So that, that is slick, um, absolutely slick. Okay, so let's save that. Let's clean up our mess here. Don't need that, don't need that, don't need that, that, okay. All right. So let's get to my bash shell. We're gonna start copying stuff from that prototyping place to the place where it needs to be. So let's, um, where am I? Let's see if we prototype me. <laughs> yeah, you got your own uh, complex football analytics to do. I definitely get it. Um, okay, so how these zones raw. We're going to put this in an inst app. What do I have in here? WW. Yep, let's throw it in here. Okay. So now we're, we're getting back to uh, something I feel like I can at least be a little more proficient in is actually baking this into the app. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do this in the server file. Now the real clean solution to this would be to make a data object via a package way of doing it, which I might do later on, but I'm lazy tonight. We're just going to do it in the app server. Um, But 
I can at least do a little more best practice of this. We are going to put this into a function, um, which will be in our helpers script right here. So if you haven't been following shiny cow development, each module that ha is in here, which right now is a grand total of one, has a separate script where we put all the business logic -y stuff in there to help with things. So we're gonna throw this in there. Um, I need to start documenting these functions. I got a whole mess here. Um, all right. Process raw functions. Now, because this isn't really gonna change, I'm just gonna make it a function with no arguments, but maybe in the future I will do something with this. Um, and we'll go back to my uh, prototyping code here. Let's split this up so I can look at it here. I'll change the paths as needed. wrap here by the way not to put you on the spot if you're still here uh, um, sorry blanking on your handle again uh, oh Ellen Hugh if you're still here um, is there a reason why maybe it's a VS code thing in general why it never defaults the word wrap I'd imagine there's a config there somewhere but that's always what annoys me is that I have to toggle that on when I do like the side-by-side -side thing and it just kind of scrolls to the right so not a big deal I just was curious um, so we got source HTML there and we got to change the path so this is going to be instant w okay and then I think we're going to we're going to preserve our attribution here. <laughs> and we'll clean up the names of these things. And the copy paste gremlin strike again. Okay. Got that. And we're going to be nice here. We're going to prefix everything here because this is technically going into a package. And then we're gonna... I literally saw your magic with this on your stream the other day, Tan, so I am trying to get better with this now. We're gonna prefix everything here. Require that. I think that's it. Okay, and then we're just going to return. I'm going to change. Change the name. This is not really a DF, is it? Uh, okay. That's that. And then now. We actually can not, we don't have to put it here. We can put it in the module itself. So that'll make it easier. What did I just call that function? Process for all time zones. And you'll see where this goes. This will be pretty elegant. Now that we've done the very hard part. And in this picker input, not gonna be choices this anymore is going to be process for all time zones. That should be the only bit we need to flip here. Let's find out. Let's get my run dev script back up here. Split that. Alright, ready? Here we go. Okay. 
Now it's a little scrunch here because I got the view pretty condensed here, but we are. Yes, look, there's the option group America there. Um, let's go back up here. Africa is here. Yep. I think we have it. We can still do the search. Yep, got the Indianapolis one. Awesome. The grouping is complete with the robust names of things. Let's just pick a let's pick Alaska. Yep, everything is updating accordingly. And I think that is awesome. So to mimic my uh, my real world usage of these things and what I do day to day is let's start um, committing things so I don't lose track of it. So whenever I do a, a package, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very impressed. But of course, if not for 10, I probably would be fumbling for another hour on this. So we are going to bump this up. that five that one and whoops did I do a comma there yeah there we go um, and then we're gonna update our news file organize the time um, choices into groups. Thanks. Now, a cool thing you can do with um, GitHub is that when you write like a markdown file or even a commit, and you know the user ID of those that maybe have helped you out or maybe reported something, you can put them in. That's where, what we're about to do here. It's actually a, a team effort on this one. It was both um, Unitan as well as a Unicorn Coder for actually giving me the, the great values. So you all are gonna get acknowledged. All right. Okay, let's start committing stuff. Um, So the time zone raw is related to what we did here. That's going to be um, in correct labels. Switch picker input, and then we're gonna. What did I do? Oh, that's a, we should reject that change. Sometimes when you're experimenting with things, you might do a new line here and there thinking you're doing something, but you don't really want to commit that stuff. So I, um, I'll just right click this and I'll discard changes on that file. There, now we're back in business there. And then I'm going to add that. I suppose I could have done that in one commit, but psh, yeah. Um, okay. Now I'm gonna hold off on committing the other ones for now because I'm gonna start doing a quick search on getting offsets for time zones. I'm not optimistic about it, but I'm curious if I can get that. And if I can, great. If not, I'll call it there. Um, but hey, worth a shot. All right. 
Now, I remember looking at, you can tell I was looking at this once before. There is um, supposedly a list of UTC offsets, but the way they organize it is not exactly scrapable where they just give the offset first and then the regions where that is a part of. That's not exactly something I can play nicely with here. Data set, database, let's see. Iana. I don't know if that's how to pronounce it, but maybe that has something here. But it's not loading on my system, so it might be a. Yeah, that was an epic fail on that site. Um, well, this sounds like a database, but I'm not sure if we can get to it. Kind of curious. Fetch data. Well, of course, everything but R is on here, but that's kind of expected. Sometimes when you find these things online that have an API, um, well, let's just click the Python thing and see what. Uh, this is a little over my head. I may bookmark this for the future, but. case not quite what I had in mind oh this is hilarious if this is the sass I think it is oh my gosh it is Those in the same industry as I am will probably get a kick out of that, that I've, I've brought up a, a resource that has this in it. Um, anyway, enough of that, enough of that. I'm guessing there probably isn't something I can find in the next like few minutes. So maybe what we'll do is let's just deploy this now and get it in there. Um, I still think what we just did was pretty darn cool. Um, so let's add our description and news. Actually, now, because that's the only thing we're going to do in this version, we're going to change this to um, shiny cow 5.1. Is that what I called it? Yes, I did. Okay. I'll just throw that in. My very creative bump version and update news. Okay. What did I do to this file? Oh, okay. That's a long story, but I have two modes of data here that the app is using. There's the, um, yeah, yeah, trust me, we're not gonna mention those three letters anymore here. Now, if it had been, is it S-A-S-S? That's the CSS stuff that we've been hearing about lately. I'll talk about that one, but not, not the one with three letters. Um, so this app, when I have the Golem app fraud flag to true, that means it's going to grab the data from my um, fancy S3 bucket on the cloud that's got the GitHub Actions thing to refresh the streamer data every six hours. So that's why I put it to true here. But at some point, I got to figure out a way to deploy like two instances of this app, so to speak. One that's like a QA kind of deployment and one that's like the real production deployment. But we did verify everything works, so I'm just gonna live dangerously and deploy now. But let's um let's push this. Although I need to see what um what branch am I on now. Oh, this is time zones. Did I 
in my repo did I do a time zone commit yet? Not a little concern. Oh, I didn't switch to the VS Code. Sorry for that. But we'll let's see what I. Yeah, I did do a time zones branch. Sorry. Okay, so we'll go back here. Um, I wish. I don't know. All right. Let's push this up. Okay, let's uh, PR that to myself, which I just did. That should register here. Yep. I'll make future notes for future me. Up the voices off. Time zone picker. Thanks to make it your GitHub handles right. Um, Get this guy off me. I'm on it. And enough I think okay should have no conflicts here we are good um, well the worst thing for me I some more is uh, in statistical computing that language was the one I started with and going from that one to R or Python or any of the other open source ones is kind of rough <laughs> It's just really rough. Um, so that that's that. Okay, now the last step is deploy time. And I've gotten that down pretty well, but let's um, show you how that works if you didn't see that before. I have a deploy script here. And basically, I'm not gonna, I have to re-enable this for a little bit. I have to set my account info because the container is not aware of it. Do that here. Let me get my heart prompt up again. And you're not going to see any of these values, so nothing is being exposed here. And then we're going to deploy it. There we go. Okay, here comes the magic from the RS Connect package, and then we will test it out. Oh, you're kidding. It had that as the experience needed? Oh, I feel all icky about that one. Um, that definitely narrows down what industry that's a part of, I'm sure. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, anyway, so while we're waiting for this, I will look at our issue tracker again and think about whatever things we want to do. So going back to Unicorn Coder's um, feedback, the thing we'll probably tackle next time are going to probably be the video thing, being able to close that. Yeah, so I, I do need to um, look at the list again. There are some out in this um, current list that actually don't have videos, but I thought they did, and I may need to take them out. Um, but that's that will be for, for next time. But yeah, I need to figure out a way to get like a dismissal thing on that video pop-up. And once I do, then I think we'll have that tidied up. And then, of course, the, the styling around the... Um, calendar elements too and the other thing which let me see if I have an issue for it um, is doing this so what is brochure if you don't know what that is 
that's a package that kind of lets you take a technically a single shiny app and then you can basically have multiple pages that look like a nav bar but when you open them up it's like a second app within your app so if you had like three tabs in your app each of these tabs with brochure is going to have a separate r process for the shiny app what i want to do there is i want to have a separate sub app for how somebody maybe that just started their data science streaming and wants to be part of shiny cow they can have a little form to fill out which will basically generate the necessary data set in this case a yaml file and automatically send a either an issue or a pr to me for the repository where the data set is and then once I merge it in, GitHub Actions will take care of actually um, refreshing the data. So that's kind of where I want to go with that. And using brochure will also enable a lot of other cool tricks for this app in the near future. So that's for next time. And um, yeah, um, I could edit, um, yeah, the um, GitHub issue message. Yeah, let me let me do that. Let me do that. So I think we can just, um, I think what you're referring to, Tan, is we can um, do um, a check, kind of like to do mark here. I do this all the time with my um, PR notes. Can I do it? Yep. There you got it. As a PR, what was it? Yep, this one. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, we got a got a sub or a follower alert, so we got the little sub train going somewhere there. Um, we have incorporated your time zone data into the app. Okay. I won't close the whole issue yet because we've still got stuff to do, but we will, um, we will, we will work on that it's later. So the deployment is done. So let's refresh this and make sure it took. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, that's not good. Now this means one of two things. A there's a package that I did not declare in the description, and in fact, that's where I'm gonna go first here. If I had to guess. Well, no kidding, you know what it is. We use our vest for this, and it's not in my imports. Of course it did that. This happened the first time we deployed too. That's the downside of Golem, is that I still have to put all the package dependencies into the description imports file, otherwise it will go crazy when we actually deploy it. So we're gonna put our vest in here. I have Tibble already, I have dplyr already. Let me look at my uh, function script to make sure I didn't miss anything. Our vest. Tibble, tidy R, deep fire Tibble, okay. Do we have Tibble on here? Yes, we do, okay. So I think it was just our vest. Yeah. Okay. Now let's uh, run the app again, make sure I didn't introduce any crazy stuff there. Bingo. It shouldn't affect the local copy of it, but we'll just run it again just in case. Yeah, everything's still fine here.
Okay, now I did a semi-silly thing. I did all that commits before um, and pushed it before I realized this error, so um, I actually yeah, well, what we'll do is we will create a new branch just for that um, change. And we'll actually deploy it now because the deployment's still manual, so it's not tied to GitHub, but we'll just deploy it again and get that in there. Back to the terminal here. Alright, try that again. Okay, Isomar has a good question. Is there or actually I'm I'm catching up on this. Okay, well, let me get to the Wes uh, Basila Buddha's question first. Silly question, is it really better to call each individual package rather than the tidyverse? That's not a silly question at all. That actually is an issue that I've seen come up a few times. If you're doing an interactive analysis, especially just a data analysis, I have absolutely no problem with people just loading up tidyverse and going to town with it. That's the beauty of that meta package is that then you don't technically have to worry about what individual packages do like the reshaping or the functional programming thing like per or the dplyr type manipulation. Now, why I don't do that here is because this app is using a package management system called RN. <laughs> I got, I got thoughts about what Chan just said. Um, but for RM, I didn't want to do Tidyverse in this app because Tidyverse has, well, as you might guess, a lot of packages in that umbrella. And my app doesn't necessarily need all of them. So for the dependencies, I like to be more explicit about them because that will minimize the footprint of the deployment when it's got brought to, in this case, shiny, shiny apps IO. Um, okay, so Isomore's question was, is there any package that will prefix your function calls with the package name, colon, colon? And apparently there is, with by far the most uh, either creative or alarming name I've heard in a long time. We're gonna search for it now, our package. My gosh, it's actually true. Is this actually on CRAN yet? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say if that's on CRAN. That would be hilarious. Yep. Okay. So that is, um, that's a thing, isn't it? And our studio add-in to easily add and remove explicit package scoping. That is gnarly. Huh. That is very, very cool. Um, oh, prefixer is another one. Oh, let's look that up too while we're waiting for the deployment. So, let's see what the differences are between these. Oh, well, okay. I, I know this is the same group that does shiny widgets, so I am a bit biased in their favor. Let's see what prefixer is. Use of the prefix function in a script to prevent use of the wrong one. A shiny gadget to add the prefix function in a script. So that sounds kind of similar. If you're in a package, you can generate import from. Oh, okay. That's pretty snazzy too. Okay. I've learned something new with this. This is really neat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, yeah. Um, it won't win any naming contest, but um, yeah, I may compare those sometime. That's that's good fine. That's going to my bookmarks now for follow-up. Yeah. Okay. And yes, I got to bookmark this too.
you know, at some point I'm going to do a stream about analyzing my bookmarks about R because there's a lot of data there that I've been using over the years that um, probably would be fascinating. Anyway, um, deployment is done. Let's see if we fix the issue. Here we go. I think we did. Let me get the font here. Okay, do the groups, groups show up? Let's scroll up here. Yes, they do. We got America. We got Asia. Atlantic. Europe. Greenwich. Greenwich, India. Yep, we got all of them here. Yes, Pinboard. Good eyes, uh, uh, West Pasetta Buddha. That is a service I've been using for... It's been like six years now. It's been a long time because what happens for me, in fact, let me show you all what Pinboard's about. Um, I'll show you my uh, default page for it. Pinboard is a site. It's a. It's basically a service, if you will, where you can um, add bookmarks or just any links to sites and via apps on your phone, or browser extensions, you can sync it across all of your devices with web browsers. So this way, if I'm on my streaming box like I am now, I move to my uh, trusty little uh, XPS 13 when I'm on uh, more mobile stuff. I can get them there. I can have them on my work laptop and I can have them on my little Android phone and not lose a beat. So with the multi-device lifestyle, it's been a lifesaver for me. So I really like that. Really like that service. So good news, I think we have... Um, so Pocket's good too, but Pocket is more for like reading stuff offline, in my opinion. Pinboard is more about, I know I need to use this, but it may not be so much for reading. It may be a link to a, a web-based app or a, another resource or things like that. Pocket is, but Pocket is still very valuable though. Um, they were bought by Mozilla before, so they should not be in any privacy problems. Although there have been people asking for them to open source it, so I don't know. Yeah, so actually that's a good point. Um, with a service like something called If This Then That, you can actually have triggers to say, okay, if I do some on pinboard with a certain tag, it can go automatically to pocket. So in fact, that's kind of what I do um, for some of these is I have a pocket tag. You can see it's bigger font, which means I've done many more of these. And all of these here go into my uh, pocket um, installation. So I have a whole mix of stuff in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me um, let me drop in the link to Pinboard um, just so you have it um, in case you were Googling it. Um, I like the use tech that makes me more productive in both the, the work stuff and just my research on these things. So um, in fact, we'll just have a little fun with this while we're here is that my collection of bookmarks about R. You can't may we Mary can't read it here, but I have 3,758 bookmarks about R. 3,758. That tells you how much I've been doing research about R, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a, it's my hobby. What can I say? Um, well, I don't know if that's a rhetorical question, uh, Equibrillium. What is data science? I think we all have our different definitions of it, but um, we 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 do a lot of data science stuff on these streams. And right now, I'll be I'm doing more of an application, but in future streams, I'm going to do some more data science stuff with some pro wrestling data that I'm trying to assemble um, in the very near future. So I think we got Shiny Cal up. Let's push that change 
to um, GitHub that description update. Oh, we already did that. I just have to merge it in, I believe. Oh no, I didn't actually. Um, let me refresh that. I thought I pushed it up. Yeah, I'm missing that. Okay, it just didn't give me that. Uh, Oh no, I may have screwed that up. Ah, that's okay, I'll fix that in over time. Um, I think we're good now. Um, so, just the recap, we now have a more friendly and hopefully more correct way of picking time zones, although the next trick will be, can we get the offsets next to each of these um, for ease of, ease of reading there. But. Progress always is in little steps, so I'm, I'm pretty psyched for that. I think we did a good job there. So, for a stream that I almost completely forgot I was going to do today, I think that was pretty good. <laughs> and thankfully the OBS setup didn't go completely haywire on me. Um, that's why I spent many, many, many hours trying to trick this out. So I could get on, get on the spot with these. So... If you're looking to find out more cool stuff about Shiny, um, you'll definitely want to check out the previous uh, recordings on the YouTube channel. That's um, youtube.com slash shiny developer series. You may have seen that scroll through the chat occasionally, and that's also linked on my, uh, my uh, Twitch profile as well. And definitely keep in touch if you have ideas for things you want me to explore. Um, definitely get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm at the Arcast, as that's been uh, scrolling a little bit down there. And yeah, we're going to do some cool stuff in the future. So thank you for joining. That was a bit impromptu. That that was more for me having a, a bit of a brain lapse there in the beginning. But we got we got some good stuff done. So I hope to see you all online at some point. And definitely um, next week, I'll continue probably with some more of that wrestling data adventures because there was uh, some good stuff that happened this past weekend and it's got a lot of people like me more excited for the for the days to come and i want to do some data science on that stuff so all right you all have a great night we will uh, talk to you next time bye everybody <laughs>